Hi everyone, um, welcome to the first content-based lecture of the course. Um, you should at this point have done the readings for module number two uh, fairly carefully, meaning the textbook readings as well as the PDF readings. Uh, you should have at this point viewed the uh, introduction to the PDF readings video, that short video that introduces in particular Kribal's reading along with the idea of semiotic theory. You should have also downloaded, as you should always do, the lecture guide that accompanies this reading and have that in front of you. Um, as explained before, these lecture guides have the key names of the photographers or philosophers or thinkers that will be covered by the lecture. They also include any important terminology uh, that I'll be going over in the lecture itself. Not the simple stuff that I think you should get pretty quickly, but anything that might be esoteric. And then they also include the main philosopher's names along with the titles of the photographs, uh, as well as the dates that we'll be covering in detail. Now there may be other photographs or images that are included in these lectures that are not on the lecture guide, they're all captioned in the uh, PowerPoint lectures, uh, but the most important images that you'll be accountable for and want to return to uh, for quizzes and, and so forth are all included on the lecture guides themselves. So um, again, we're just going to set up the context and historical backdrop for the invention of photography at the beginning of the 19th century and talk about, in particular, three of the major kind of inventors of photography and how these photographs were conceived uh, early on and what the uses, usages were that they uh, thought of for these photographs. And those photographers are uh, Nisifor Nieps from France, uh, and his ideas were picked up a little bit later by Louis Daguerre who invented the daguerreotype along with the help of Niepce and his uh, brother Isidore Niepce. Uh, and then spend a little bit more time on Henry Fox Talbot, as well as Sir John Herschel, who is in the background of developing um, the idea of the photograph that was um, patented by Henry Fox Talbot, known as the calotype. In any case, before we get started on all of that, since we live in a world today in which I think most of our familiarity with photography, probably many of you know more than this, but most of our familiarity of photography comes through digital photography. So we may not understand the way that a photograph or a camera that used film or some kind of filmic type media worked. And what I mean by filmic type media, and I'll just call this filmic media, is that most of us are familiar with uh, 35 millimeter camera film, or maybe you know you saw, saw an old movie in which this was used if you're of a younger generation. Um, before they developed film, there were various other photosensitive media. Uh, for instance, a daguerreotype uses a metal plate that is a highly polished silver surface um, or, you know, various forms of paper that is photosensitized. Almost all of these, by the way, use various types of silver amalgams to make a filmic media sensitive to light um, that are based upon the same principle when it comes to a camera. Now, I'll go into some of the details of the technology here in this lecture, but a lot of the, the really nitty gritty details, I think, are best covered by the textbook. And so there's no reason for me to go into all the chemical compounds that were used uh, to increase sensitivity and so forth. Um, you can find that in the textbook and the most important developments I will bring up in these lectures in a kind of simplified form. So let's start with the basic idea of a camera. And I want to start this by saying that the idea of a camera itself, of what we call a pinhole camera, a very rudimentary camera, has been around for a very long time. As a matter of fact, the very first documented reference to a pinhole camera comes from the Chinese philosopher Mo Ti 
from the 5th century BCE who describe basically what you're seeing here without the ability uh, to capture the image. And what I mean by this is a pinhole camera, you may have made one of these in high school, may have even messed around with creating one of these uh, around the time of the eclipse so that you could view the eclipse without burning your retinas is pretty simple and kind of magical. If you have a, what we see here, and I will do this a lot, you, if you just follow my cursor here on the screen, and again, mess around a little with these Panopto lectures, I don't think there's any reason for you to necessarily, um, you know, be looking at my face while I'm talking. You can just listen to my voice and increase the size of the image. But if you follow my cursor here, you see this box over here with just a little hole in it, a pinhole. And, um, you know, this is your basic camera. The way that this works is that a darkened box, um, again, with no other way for light to enter it other than this pinhole, when pointed at an object that is illuminated by light, will actually create an image in that darkened interior of the object that it's pointed at although that image will be upside down, inverted, in that darkened interior. Now, um, again, this has been around for a very, very long time, um, but the ability, what actually happens when we get to photography, uh, the ability to actually fix that image, to capture that image, so to speak, to uh, have it imprint either on film or some kind of photosensitive paper that is a negative or a positive, and I'll get to this later on, was the big development of the 19th century. Now, people had known for quite a long time, frankly, as well, that silver was particularly sensitive to, to light, although you know it's not until the 17th century or so that they really totally figure this out. And what I mean by that is that most filmic media, whether it be a photosensitive piece of paper, a piece of metal that has been silvered, or later on film, use various forms of, not on film so much, but various forms of silver amalgams, um, which were sensitive to light, to fix that image. In other words, the basic idea of the pinhole camera then was developed so as to include some kind of photosensitive medium. Again, later on this is film, early on it's photosensitive paper covered with silver amalgams or a, uh, a, a metal plate that would um, capture that image. Think of it this way. If you have silver jewelry or silverware, you know that if you leave it out in the light, especially sunlight for any period of time, it will tarnish, it will get darkened. That's the basic idea of a photographic media, except that uh, you want, of course, in this photographic media, really, really sensitive, uh, you know, forms of silver, silver nitrate, silver amalgams. So if we're keeping our eye on the development of photography over the 19th century, just to kind of put the cart before the horse a little bit here, there are a number of technical issues that need to be solved. Number one, how can you create a photographic media that is increasingly sensitive to light? In other words, early on, that photographic media is so non-sensitive to light that it might take up to 24 hours to actually create uh, a photograph. And then as you increase the sensitivity of that photographic media, you know, from 24 hours to 10 hours to an hour to, you know, down to a number of seconds and then finally to split seconds, you have to increase the photosensitivity of the filmic media. Um, the other problem that they're going to have to solve uh, right off the bat is, you know, think of it this way. If a media is sensitive to light, let's say originally they're printing, um, you know, they're imprinting light on a photographic medium, um, how do you not only fix that image, but stop it from continuing to develop? Another way to put this is if your photographic media is sensitive to light and you expose that media to light so that it imprints whatever object you're pointing this at, how do you then after this 
stop that photographic media from continuing to develop when you take it out and start showing it to people. Now, the technical side of this um, is one of the reasons that photography develops when it does. There's ever increasing sophisticated use of lenses. There's ever increasing uh, access to and understanding of various chemical compounds and how you can increase sensitivity and uh, fix the image and, and decrease its sensitivity after you fixed it so it doesn't continue to develop. All of this happens when it does because the technology is developing at this time on the one hand and we'll get to some of the other reasons uh, later on. Now the second uh, image that I have up here has you know moved the camera forward um, basically to the beginning of the um, you know uh, 20th century rather in which we've got a film camera. Uh, it didn't need to be a roll film camera with 35 millimeter for my example here. I just wanted to give you the basic idea of how this this camera develops. Um, first, you know, you take a pinhole camera, and and this goes way back as well. And instead of just using a pinhole as your aperture or your opening to allow light into the interior of the black box, you affix a lens to the uh, front of this darkened box. Um, those lenses again will start uh, as a kind of fixed lens with a bellows on it, meaning that you've got something that, if you follow my uh, cursor here again, allows this lens to go out further or be compressed a little bit more so as to be able to focus on whatever object you're wanting to focus on. Later on, of course, we're able to do this with twist uh, to the lens. Then, of course, you're going to need something that on the one hand blocks the light and then later allows the light into the darkened interior. Later on this will be a shutter, something that is mechanically controlled to open the aperture and close the aperture at set speeds to allow a particular amount of light into the darkened interior to expose the film or the photographic media to light. Uh, early on, they don't have apertures, although this develops fairly quickly. They just have like a, uh, a little, um, just basically a piece of metal that blocks the aperture and you open it for a particular amount of time using a stopwatch for whatever time you need and then you close it again. Uh, and then of course, um, you know, as things develop, you're going to start using uh, greater forms of technology and we'll get to that when that's appropriate. Okay, hopefully that gives you a basic idea of how a camera works if you didn't already know. And if you're still confused about this, you know, it's pretty simple to look up more examples of this or to go to your textbook and, and to check that out as well. So then the deep history, as I said before, the basic idea of a camera goes way back in time. Um, uh, you know, we talked about Moti very briefly in the fifth century BCE philosopher who basically um, describes the effect of a pinhole camera. Uh, then later on, we know that the ancient Greeks knew uh, about the basic idea of a pinhole camera. For instance, uh, Aristotle in about 350 BCE describes uh, how a pinhole camera would work. However, he's got his optics a little bit off. He actually thought, the ancient Greeks thought, that the way that the eye worked is that it emitted light that captured an object of sight uh, and then kind of touched that and transferred that information back to the eye. Later on, um, the famous Arabic scholar Al-Hazen, who was a, uh, you know, he's an astronomer, a physicist, uh, chemist, a philosopher, described the way that optics worked in a much more accurate fashion in which, of course, what we know today is that objects don't really emit light, they reflect light that is then captured in the, in the eye itself by the retina, much the same way that a camera works. And, uh, and from Al Hazen's ideas, going very quickly through this, Renaissance architects and philosophers and thinkers, and in particular artists, started to employ these ideas in the middle of the 15th century to help them create ideal, very rationalized pictures. 
As a matter of fact, some of the implements that were developed to capture the way that the eye supposedly saw in a very perfect way, uh, not in the way that we actually see, but in that perfect idealized way that the Renaissance classical artist wanted to capture, are things like this that you see on the screen. This is a, uh, a print of Leon Battista Alberti's Velo, as he called it, which is an implement that allowed a artist, or frankly anyone, to help capture the way something looked in a rationalized way. And the way that this worked, and I'll show you another example of this in a moment, um, again, follow my cursor, is that the artist or whoever is doing the drawing looks through an aperture here. And that aperture, you're looking through this, then you look through a gridded, translucent, in this case, a piece of paper onto the image that you're trying to look at, and sometimes this, by the way, piece of paper was gridded off so that you can basically copy exactly what you're seeing through this kind of rudimentary camera. A camera in the sense that it rationalizes sight. It makes it something that can very carefully be um, documented supposedly accurate, accurately, although we're really talking about idealistically, but doesn't have the ability to directly imprint um, light on that uh, that medium. Another example of this that may help you to kind of conceive of this is a famous uh, woodblock print by Albrecht Durer showing you how linear perspective works employing a velo. And in this case, again, you see the person who's doing the drawing on the right hand side looking over the top of a stylus that helps him to focus his vision from one point through a gridded translucent plane onto the object that he's trying to draw and then transfer that image onto the gridded piece of paper down below him. It's like a camera that doesn't have the ability again to fix the image, but the idea is the same. Now here's what I mean by linear perspective. If you've never taken an art history course before, you may not know this, but linear perspective, which may have been around as early as the ancient Romans, but was kind of re um, uh, you know, re-explored uh, during the Renaissance, starting with people like Leon Battista Alberti in the middle of the 15th century, follows this basic idea that, um, that on any image that you're looking at, for instance here, there is a horizon line. That horizon line is basically coextensive with the height at which you're seeing um, some kind of scene. And on that horizon line, there is this vanishing point right here where the train tracks come together. Now, think of, if I go uh, back here, think of that vanishing point as being the opposite of what this little stylus is. It exists over here, basically symmetrically opposite of the stylus. And what it allows you to do is create in perspective, kind of a, an illusion of three dimensionality, um, the scene that you see in front of you so that everything that is perpendicular um, to a ground plane and um, that is uh, receding into depth will all recede to this one central vanishing point. Now, the whole reason I'm telling you about this is to get to a kind of larger point, which is this way of seeing isn't the way that we actually see the world. It's a rationalization of sight. It's a way of submitting the way that our eye experiences the world to a program, to a, a very sophisticated kind of mathematical system um, that allows you to show the world in perfect perspective. And when the camera comes around, because this is so closely aligned with the way that um, you know, people thought of uh, sight working in a perfect way. A linear perspective seemed to predate all of the things that the camera was able to mechanize. Or another way to put this is the camera became like a, a mechanical eye that captured one split second in time is exactly and as rationally, not as experientially, not the way we see the world itself, but as perfectly as uh, you can imagine the perfect 
I working? Or another way to put this is, when you look at an object, you will also, you'll always uh, observe this object in time, right? You'll see it from multiple different, slightly different perspectives. Like when you see something and you can't understand it very well, you'll tip your head to one side or look at it slightly from another angle. And all of those little different perspectives are fused together uh, in your mind. Linear perspective did that all at once, or that's at least the way it was conceived. So if you look at this image of a foreshortened figure uh, by an Italian Renaissance artist, Mantegna, and you see on the left-hand side the way that that figure is submitted to linear perspective, you see the way that this perspective works. Now, um, starting, you know, in the 16th, 17th century, we start getting more and more references to pinhole cameras and then later on to camera obscuras, which I'm going to go into now. A camera obscura, again, like a pinhole camera, is just the next stage uh, of technology along the way to creating a camera that can actually capture an image. And here you see a pinhole camera or a kind of camera obscura uh, written up by the, uh, the thinker Christopher Shiner in 1630 showing you a light source passing through a pinhole and, um, you know, um, and showing up on, in this case, a, a piece of paper that then could be copied, uh, drafted very carefully by an artist. Or another example of this by Johann Zahn from 1685 showing you the way that that pinhole camera works. And now we've got pinhole cameras that are so big that you could actually be in the interior with the image that is passing through the pinhole into that darkened interior and see that image and copy it. Now it's um, not, it doesn't take very long until people start developing what's known as the camera obscura. The first example of this goes all the way back to Leonardo da Vinci who talked about this. And um, there's a little bit of contention around how often artists actually used a camera obscura. But the basic idea is to take that pinhole camera to affix a lens to it. So if you follow my cursor again, to affix a lens to it, to point it at objects who then are captured in this interior but in the interior now, you've got a mirror. And that mirror then projects that in image onto a glass surface that if slightly darkened can be viewed from the outside and um, you know, copied. You can actually see the way this works. And you can see how this person is thinking about, um, by no way that is, how that camera obscura is basically a mechanization of sight, right? Here's an eye. Here's the way that the eye works by capturing an image and then projecting it, we would know now, down through the optical nerve into the brain. And here is the camera, like a mechanized eye. Here's a, a you know, bigger example of a camera obscura. So you know, think of this existing uh, at the time that the first major inventors start to figure out how you could fix this transitive image that is a part of a camera obscura, how you can put a photographic media in the interior of this camera obscura and actually capture that image. In addition to the camera obscura, of course, people have been trying to uh, perfect the way that images could be captured or to rationalize these to actually create them as accurately as possible. But by accurate, again, I don't mean accurate to the way our eye sees, but accurate to perfection. We are in the age of positivism, by the way. And another mechanism that was used is this Physiono trace silhouette device that basically what you see here is that someone's sitting in front of a translucent, in this case, glass plane with a light source on one side of them that creates a silhouette on the glass plane. And the operator would actually move a instrument along the contours of this silhouette. And that instrument was attached to another implement that would engrave this image on a metal plate that could be turned into a print later on. So you would have an actual 
almost direct transference of the movement of this implement that traced the contour of the face onto an, uh, an engraving uh, plate that then could be turned into a very, very accurate print of the person's profile in any case. Okay, I'm going to pause here for a minute and I'll be right back and we'll go into the first um, of the major inventors of photography, uh, Niesfor Nieps, who was the first to really fix an image and his ideas then got picked up by uh, others. So before we get into Nieps, just a few more words about the context here. There are some um, precursors to, uh, to the development of photography that you'll read about in your textbook. For instance, in 1725 on the, the chemical side of things, so the, the camera obscura has been around for a while now, but on the chemical side of how do you fix that image, um, Johann Heinrich Schulze, uh, in 1725 was able to demonstrate that silver nitrate, which is an amalgam of sil uh, silver, actually darkens in response to sunlight instead of heat. That is something that's in the background of a lot of this thinking. By 1802, Thomas Wedgwood um, describes his work in the Journal of, Royal, um, uh, of the Royal Institution as an account of the method of copying paintings on glass uh, as using, again, silver nitrate. So he's got the theory down there, but it really doesn't get developed until the beginning of the 19th century by the characters that I'm gonna go into now. Also, in terms of the wider context, scholars have debated quite a bit about where, you know, the interest in developing photography came from. As your text points out, there's a, in the 19th century, a profound kind of cultural transformation, um, you know, with the development of the middle class and so forth, and with the development of uh, scientific inquiry, uh, chemistry, optics, and so forth. Um, second, of course, um, a lot of people think of photography as a, a originating from a desire to extend uh, traditions of painting and drawing and while later on in the century, I think that's absolutely true, early on, keep your eye on this, uh, most of these earlier uh, inventors of photography aren't really thinking about photography as an art form. They're thinking of photography as something that's able to capture an image and reproduce an object in a reproducible medium that can be used for many different reasons, uh, you know, from creating likenesses of human beings to uh, documenting uh, other uh, paintings, for instance, to uh, creating a document of various fossil forms or whatever. They're not really thinking of it as artistic. Um, uh, another um, reason or rationale for the popularization and rapid development of photography is that with the increase of uh, the middle class um, and access to photography, people, of course, want, and you'll see this next week, images of themselves. It's one of the things that we do with photography quite a bit today, right? To create a portrait of ourselves or to document our family or a loved one. Uh, and then, of course, um, people, one of the other reasons for the development of photography is tied to the others, which is you've got a whole bunch of basically scientists and chemists and, um, you know, whether they're, they're actual professionals or amateurs uh, who are just playing around with these, these technical developments and seeing where they go. So... Um, the increasing demand by the middle class for images, uh, whether they be images of themselves or images for popular entertainment or images 
uh, from across the world of scenes that they couldn't otherwise see is the big one that I want you to be thinking about as we go forward here. So Niesaphore Nieps uh, is a French man, and he's often been described as a kind of country uh, gentleman slash scientist. He's, um, he's a you know, he's working outside of the city center of Paris, kind of on his own, fairly isolated. He was born in 1765, as you see here. He's a French landowner with some scientific interest and did a lot of experiments with a printing form known as lithography. Um, and he wanted a, a form and he knew about these earlier developments uh, when it came to the camera obscura and ideas about silver nitrates and fixing images and so forth. He wanted a, a, a quicker way to basically copy um, various lithographs so they could reproduce them. And he began experimenting uh, with the camera obscura and fixing images. Um, but the way that he went about this is, is kind of interesting. It's not really quite photography yet. One of the first supposed photographic images you see here on the screen in front of you, uh, known as the, uh, a view from the window at Grasse from 1826. What, um, what Nies, uh, Niesifor Nieps did is he used a camera obscura and he created a photographic medium, uh, not from silver nitrates, which he had started playing around with, but he, he, the first photographic image such as this one came from a different photographic type of media. What he did was he basically covered a plate, in this case, a piece of metal, um, with a particular kind of medium known as bitumen of Judea. And bitumen of Judea is a kind of naturally occurring tar, been used in a lot of things before, which he figured out that when you expose bitumen to light, the areas that are exposed to light uh, become fixed to the photographic substrate, in this case, a plate. And then if you take this uh, exposed image and you um, uh, put a bath of a lavender oil over the top of it, all of the parts of the bitumen that had not been exposed to light actually wash away, and the areas that have been exposed to light uh, are fixed. Now, at this stage, when he created this image, um, which is just out of his studio window, you've got an image of something that took 24 hours of exposure. So think about the limitations of this, right? You can't obviously capture an image of anything that's moving. Um, you can't, you know, anything that's uh, transient at all isn't going to be captured. And basically what you're creating is what's known as a positive image. As photography develops, except for the daguerreotype, which is also a positive image, most photography created a photographic negative image that then could be resubmitted to light onto another medium to create a positive image, but we'll get to that in a minute. So he, he starts playing around with this form and he, you know, he has some kind of limited success here. Um, he uh, is writing to his brother, who Isadora Nieps, who will take on the mantle of the first photographer from him uh, later on in time when he dies fairly young, um, and uh, begins to, again, figure out ways to, to create these images using bitumen. He called these, by the way, not photographs. Photograph will come much later on. He called them heliographs or sun pictures. And in this case, you see a picture that is created through the same process where he uh, fixes the, he basically takes his uh, camera and points it at a photograph, or not a photograph, a painting, or an, uh, in this case, a, a uh, print of Cardinal Ambrose, Ambrose um, again in 1826, and, and you know, leaves that shutter open or leaves the aperture open for a great amount of time until he creates 
this rough image of the scene that he was pointing it at. Obviously, the images that you see here, they're very rough, but they are the first images in which you're able to stabilize or fix the image that a pinhole or camera obscura could capture using this bitumen process, a positive print, a still life from, again, the same year, 1826. Now, when he dies, his brother Isadora Nieps um, hooks up, begins corresponding, with the major French uh, developer of photographic technology, Louis Daguerre, who created what is known as the Daguerreotype. Now, Louis Daguerre uh, was a popular entertainer, as you will have read of uh, about in your textbook. Um, he's been variously described as ambitious, clever, proud, and arrogant. By 16 years old, he was an assistant stage designer at the Paris Theater, and over the course of his career, he developed a really popular form of entertainment known as the diorama, which by 1822 was something that everyone was going to. A, a diorama is basically a theatrical scene that used what were known as magic lanterns to create these really illusionistic theater performances. And what I mean by this is that a magic lantern is basically a high-powered light source that by using various types of originally cutouts and silhouettes and, and things that look kind of like puppet shows, uh, images in front of it could project shadows and shapes on various scrims and gauzes and sheets uh, in an interior that the audience would view through a, a kind of gauze-like um, aperture so it, it would look like um, a really really and by the way there were smoke machines and all kinds of things like that uh, look like a really rudimentary form of theater meaning cinema uh, or um, you know something like a, a puppet show or something that's just kind of popular entertainment there are oftentimes live figures in there along with these shadows, animals in there, real trees, and so forth. And it was just a form of popular entertainment. So Louis Daguerre was interested in this technology that was being developed by Niesephore Nieps and his brother Isidore in order to increase the types of images that he could project in his, uh, in his um, uh, dioramas. As a matter of fact, um, when he was criticized for his dioramas, here's what he said, um, quote, many art critics regard the way I mix nature with art as a crime. They say my live goat, my constructed house, my real pine trees are not allowable materials for the painter. That may be true. My only aim was to bring out the highest illusion. That's what he was interested in, illusion. I wanted to steal from nature and had to become a thief. So how did he become an even better thief, I suppose? Well, by developing imagery, um, which in the end he didn't even use to project in his, in his uh, uh, diorama scenes. So what did he do then? Here's a picture of Louis-Jacques Mon Daguerre, uh, and this is a daguerreotype. What he basically did is, in consultation with an, a number of other figures, chemists and physicists and uh, people in technology and lenses and so forth, and in the background of this whole story, by the way, is this really interesting character, um, Sir John Herschel, who's a British chemist who is sharing his ideas with everyone. He figured out that if you took a, instead of using the form that Isadora and Niesephore Nieps used, which is that vitamin uh, type of uh, photographic media, he figured out that if you took a, a copper plate, and originally, by the way, it was all silver, but that was too expensive, took a copper plate and you silvered the surface of it, put a, a layer of silver and later silver amalgam over this copper plate and use that in the interior of a camera obscura, you could capture an image. Now, originally, again, 
This photographic medium, the uh, silvered plate, is not very sensitive, and so he's having to uh, he's having to expose these things to light for extraordinary amounts of time. But then, over the course of a number of years, and we're talking about you know fourteen years or so of messing around with this process, he supposedly by accident figures out that if you partially expose this copper plate that's been silvered to light, let's say for a limited amount of time, let's say 10 minutes or so, and it's usually more than that, um, and then you submit this image to, um, to basically vapors of uh, mercury, um, it will develop in relation to that um, to that uh, exposure to vaporized mercury. Now, the way he said this happened is that he partially exposed a plate, he stuck it in a cupboard, just happened to have mercury in there in the cupboard, and the vapors attached to the silver and basically allowed this image to develop further. Then, of course, you have to fix this image because if you expose that image again to light, it's just going to all go black. And the way that he did this is by uh, submitting that silvered surface to originally basically just table salts, which desensitize the silver surface and stop it from continuing to develop. Now, Sir John Herschel, this British chemist, eventually tells him uh, how to create a bath, uh, what becomes known as a hypobath, uh, which is hyposulfate uh, um, uh, mixed with water that you submit this plate to to stop it from continuing to develop. In any case, you keep kind of getting better and better at the sensitized surface, exposure times start going down a little bit, and you can create now really photographic images. This is what's known as a daguerreotype. And one of the most famous early daguerreotypes is this, the Paris Boulevard from 1839, where out of the window of supposedly his studio, he uh, you know, shot, uh, with a camera, this scene of Paris Boulevard with a little man getting his shoe shined, which you see down here below. Now the thing is that, you know, probably when he uh, did this, there's no way the exposure time could have caught this figure. I'll give you a close up of this guy having his shoe shine. Uh, unless that guy was down there, you know, having one shoe shined and not moving it for 15 minutes or so. Uh, and so it's probably a staged photograph, but nonetheless, it's an incredibly good photographic image, isn't it? Now, here's the thing. A daguerreotype is what we call a positive image. Think of film photography, where in film photography, you expose the film to light the areas that are lightest in the original scene actually show up as the darkest parts on the film. And then you develop that film and then you print that film. In other words, you reverse it on a printing process by exposing it to light onto another photographically sensitive media, a, uh, a you know print paper, and it inverts the image from dark to light. Daguerreotypes are not that. Daguerreotypes, the film, so to speak, is the plate itself. There is no negative to this. However, if you've ever seen a daguerreotype, which are incredibly precious, high fidelity images, they get so accurate so quickly, um, you'll know that if you tip them a little bit one way or another, they go from positive to negative right in front of your eyes. But you can't reprint them. They're just one image. You can't then go reprint this as multiple different pictures. A daguerreotype is a singular image of a plate that has been exposed to light. Now again, what is the process of this? First, you take a polished silver surface, usually a copper plate, and later on they'll use other forms of metal plates to cheapen the process and you highly polish this, you um, then expose that plate to fumes of hot iodine, uh, which then converts the silver surface to minute dots of iodide, uh, which then forms a kind of iodide of silver. This is a silver amalgam again, that's fairly sensitive to light. 
After you do that, you put this in the camera and you expose it to the subject. Originally, this is in the, you know, 1830s, early 40s. It's anywhere from five to 40 minutes exposure time. Um, and then you take this out and you put it in a darkened interior and expose it to hot mercury vapors, which then form an amalgam mixture or compound with the dots of iodide of silver, uh, making the latent image, an image that hadn't shown up yet, visible. And this increases, again, the quality or the resolution of that image. After you do that, you have to expose the unexposed dots. You have to take this whole plate and um, take all those spots of silver that hadn't been hit with light. You don't want them to continue to develop and um, put them in a bath. First, he started with common table salts, and then later he uses a hypo bath or hyposulfate bath. Again, this is just kind of basic um, chemistry involved in this. I'm not going to ask you about, you know, what all of these different chemical compounds are. I just want you to know that that is in the background of this. How do you develop that technology? So what did he use it for, right? What were the original daguerreotypes? Well, they're things like this. They could be anything. You uh, obviously you can't with the exposure times being as long as they were. You can't very well, um, you know, uh, capture um, things that are in movement. So you take pictures of, let's say, scientific artifacts such as fossils. Uh, you take pictures of um, buildings, right? Here's his uh, model of the daguerreotype camera. Again, very, very simple and just kind of follow along with me. You have a lens and a lens cap that allows light when you take it off to be exposed to, here's the little piece that um, uh, has the photographic media on it, that metal plate, which you see over here. Very, very simple kind of mechanism for the fixing of light. And here is the daguerreotype process again. So again, a little bit more, uh, we're going forward in time here to the 1850s or so. Basic camera obscura uh, pointed at a object that is illuminated by light. You expose that uh, sensitized plate to light and then you uh, fix it by, um, uh, you know, um, submitting it to hypobath and mercury is a va vapor and then you've got your photographic image. Here's what it looks like if you magnetize the surface of a daguerreotype 13,000 times or so. These little particles of mercury silver amalgam are the things that are sensitive to light. Those that are exposed to light, of course, darken and, um, uh, you know, accept the image. And those that aren't exposed don't get exposed. They get washed away in the hypobath, thus creating the the very accurate image. This is supposedly the first portrait of a man, and this is where things get really interesting, but we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail next week. It's Monsieur Huvet in 1837, uh, captured by Daguerre. And frankly, this is the direction that the, the Daguerreotype went. It's an incredibly accurate, quite sensitive photographic media. It creates really, really sharp images. Um, now they have fairly long exposure times at first, but the portrait became the favorite usage or genre of the daguerreotype. And here you see a photographer at work, 1843, taking a photograph of someone who's seated for this. Now, I want to point out a couple of things about this. Um, number one, um, these photographers, by the way, were originally called operators. They're not told, called photographers at all. And what he's doing is he's opened the, uh, the lens or the aperture to point at this figure. This figure has to sit incredibly still. You'll see a couple of implements that were used to hold people's faces still as they sat originally for up to five minutes, 10 minutes, at a time in front of this, this camera in order to get their portrait taken. 
here's one of those implements. <laughs> so people would go sit down for these. And if you've ever wondered why those old, old photographs always have people looking, um, no smiles, right? No facial expressions. They look really stiff. It's because they couldn't hold a smile and it would get all blurry. So they just kept a very stiff face. They also had these implements that would hold their head from moving at all behind them, carefully hidden from uh, exposure, of course, but to keep their heads still. Uh, they also powdered their faces to make them very white so as to increase the exposure. Sometimes people were given uh, in the later 19th century drugs, uh, laudanum in particular, so that they would hold still for these photographs. The other thing about a daguerreotype is that they're, they're these little metal plates, so you bend them at all, it just cracks the uh, photograph right off the surface. So they had to come up with various frames and enclosures to keep these things safe. And here you see some of those. You see on the very upper left-hand side, the silvered copper plate, which is the photograph itself. Uh, and then you see a piece of sheet brass mat that, that goes over this to frame it. And then over the court, uh, top of that protective borders and finally a velvet lined case uh, to keep this thing safe from any kind of scratches. And here's just a couple of those, those photographs, right, later on in the century. By 1850 or so, they've decreased the exposure time quite dramatically, down to five seconds, and then within years, down to a couple seconds or less. I'm going to pause here again for a moment. Now, a couple other things to say about um, Louis Daguerre. Um, number one, he got famous pretty quickly. He had a, uh, a good kind of PR person, Louis Arego, who was able to uh, announce to the public um, this great invention of photography. Um, and, uh, you know, you can read about this in your textbook, but Francis Arego basically published a paper uh, called The First Practical and Successful Photographic Process in 1839 that announced to the public, um, you know, what was going on in photography and put Louis Daguerre kind of on the map. He was the first one to kind of make this stuff public. Uh, Louis Daguerre too, um, and this is one of the reasons that the, the daguerreotype became so popular, uh, didn't patent his process. He, let, he got a 6,000 franc kind of stipend a little bit of that money actually went back to uh, the Nieps family um, uh, for his invention. And then it was made public in every part of the world except for England. Uh, Great Britain didn't, uh, he patented it there. The French and the British were constant rivals at this point. Uh, and so if you're working out of uh, England, you had to get rights to use the daguerreotype, but everywhere else in the world it was open to the public, which increased its popularity. This is important because the other major inventor of photography is Henry Fox Talbot over in uh, England, who patented his process, um, the calotype, and that kind of uh, decreased the popularity of the calotype because you had to get and pay rights to, to use this stuff. So then just very briefly, there's another figure in France around the same type, uh, time, Hippolyte Bayard, who also was developing his own form of photography itself, uh, in which, you know, he, I just wanted to kind of mention this figure because uh, he had a very viable process. It was uh, very similar to, uh, to what the daguerreotype was doing as well. Um, and he had, you know, success right around the same time as uh, Louis Daguerre did, but uh, probably through a little bit of um, insider trading, so to speak, they put the kibosh on him really getting uh, the notoriety that he should have had. So here is a photograph of him. He basically, it's a positive print. He submitted a lace glove on top of a photographically sensitized plate and then exposed it to light, creating this likeness of that lace glove. Uh, he also, of course, put flowers and leaves on photographic paper and exposed them 
uh, to light. He called these nature paintings, by the way. Uh, he tried to get people to pay attention and to pay him for the type of work that he was doing. Here he is uh, creating a composition with various sculptures in the same type of process. His garden, again, using basically things very similar to the daguerreotype. Um, but he felt that, uh, in particular, um, uh, uh, Francois Arago didn't help him out with the French ministry and actually kind of told the French ministry not to pay him to develop his art, which, you know, he didn't have enough money to develop it on his own. And so, kind of in his own way, he makes reference to the way that the, the public didn't support him or the French ministry didn't support him in this self-portrait as a drowned man, right? Very melancholic, the world's not treating me fairly type of portrait. Now, of course, he didn't die. Here he is in 1847 in his self-portrait. And anyway, I just wanted you to know that guy is out there. And now uh, we're gonna go on to the, the other major character at this moment in time over in England, Win, uh, William Henry Fox Talbot. Now I've given you a reading on uh, Fox Talbot here, Talbot, talking about how he developed the, the form. So I'm not going to go into all that detail here. You can, I'll give you a little schematic of this, but um, you can find that both in the text and in the PDF reading where he goes very systematically through his uh, invention, right? So Henry Fox Talbot is kind of like the opposite of uh, someone like Niepce, he was a total Renaissance uh, figure. He, he was someone who was a scientist. He was uh, a man of letters. He was, uh, you know, someone who was interested in chemistry, uh, uh, physics, and so forth. He was someone who uh, had a lot of success in, in the sciences and especially in scholarship before he started to develop photography. Now, as you will have read, um, Talbot's uh, interest in developing photography came from, at least in his own narrative about this, his inability to draw. Um, as he said, when he was off uh, on, on the Grand Tour, which was a, a trip through all the major classical centers of Europe, and he was hanging out in Lake Como in Italy in 1833, um, he was using uh, something called a camera lucida, which you see here, which is a, an instrument that's basically, you look through a prism and it allows you to see, on the one hand, something that the prism is pointed at, let's say a building or landscape, but it also allows you to see the drawing surface that you're drawing on simultaneously, so you can in theory anyway, kind of copy what your eye is seeing out here directly on uh, the, the paper down below you where it projects an image of this. Now I've, I've tried to mess around with these before and it kind of gives you a devil vision. So it's no, no surprise that it didn't work very well for him, but he couldn't draw worth a darn. And this instrument wasn't helping him very well either. And as he wrote in this fairly melodramatic report, um, about this, this kind of originary interest in developing photography. He said, when the eye was removed from the prism, meaning the camera lucida, in which all looked beautiful, I found that the faithless pencil had left only traces on the paper, melancholy to, <laughs> to uh, behold. Here's his pencil drawing, by the way. I then thought of trying again a method which I had tried many years before. This method was to take a camera obscura and to throw the image of the objects on a piece of transparent tracing paper laid on a pane of glass in the focus of the instrument. This led me to reflect on the in, uh, in, uh, inimitable beauty of the pictures of nature's painting, which the glass lens of the camera throws upon the paper in its focus fairy pictures creations of a moment and destined as rapidly to fade away. It was during these thoughts that the idea occurred to me, how charming it would be if it were possible to cause these natural images to imprint themselves durably and to remain fixed upon the paper. And why should this not be possible? Indeed. So when 
Henry Talbert, uh, Talbot returned to England in January of 1834. He began to uh, experiment with silver nitrate. And again, these properties had been known um, for quite a while. What he did was he basically painted uh, this white substance of silver nitrate on paper. And then in a camera obscura, he submitted this to light uh, and it developed very slowly. Um, then he messed around with what is known as silver chloride solution and did the same thing. Now, what happens when you do this, unlike the daguerreotype, is that what you create is a negative image of what you're looking at. So, uh, you know, originally, I'm going to get to this in a minute. Originally, before he even created this kind of photographic negative positive print, he was doing basically um, contact prints. He was exposing various objects to photographically sensitized paper without a camera obscura, like you see here, of leaves. And then he starts to mess around with the camera obscura and these pieces of paper that had been photosensitized, thus creating the first truly positive negative photograph here, a window at Laycock Abbey, this latticed window um, in 1835. Now, a positive negative print, and before I get to that, I'm sorry, before I get to that, I should say that what he was so amazed with at these images, how accurate they were. And I'm thinking, compared to the daguerreotype, when I look at this, not very accurate at all, frankly. Um, but he went on to say, you know, when you looked at this image of the window at Laycock Abbey, when first made, as he said, quote, the squares of glass, about 200 in number, could be counted with the help of a, a magnifying glass and got very accurate. And that's what he really liked about this. Now, this is, again, where this goes. Uh, uh, eventually, what he does is that he sensitizes basically waxed paper, a paper with wax on it to make it semi-translucent, and creates these photographic negatives. You see the negative over there on the right-hand side. It's uh, obviously inverted. Everything that is going to be positively printed in black is very white. Everything that is going to end up white is very black. And then you resubmit a photographically uh, sensitized piece of paper uh, and project light through the negative onto this piece of paper. Originally, just by creating a sandwich, you just put it on top of each other and submit it to light, and you can create this uh, positive image from the negative. Now, what this has going for it is that, unlike the daguerreotype, you can create multiples from a photographic negative. The daguerreotype is a single. The positive negative process that he created here allows you to create multiple copies of something that you've created as a photographic negative. And later on, of course, you'll be able to, not, not now, but later on in the century, you'll be able to uh, increase and decrease the size of this by creating um, larger and smaller prints of the original neg negative process. Now again, here's how he went through it. Just various, this is just a short uh, schematic of his invention process. First, he starts by creating direct impressions. Um, then he decided, you know, here's another way to incre increase the sensitivity of the paper. He dipped paper in a salt water solution, allowed it to dry, and then painted on the silver nitrate. The chemical reaction between the two substances resulted in a precipitation of silver chloride. And he found that if you created a weak solution of salt, in other words, less salt, you could create greater sensitivity. And then he uh, continued to develop this. His second breakthrough was the stabilization of the image itself. And this is, as he points out, once you've, of course, um, exposed a negative, in this case, uh, a sensitized piece of paper to light, you have to stabilize it. And um, the way that he did this originally was to basically put that negative in boiling water to take away any of the remaining silver salts that hadn't been 
um, exposed. And then later on, uh, Sir John Herschel, hearing of his development, sent him um, some information about how to create a hyposulfate bath to take away all of those instead of just desensitizing them, actually wash away all the unexposed silver nitrates uh, in order to create a stabilized image. Then, by the way, Sir John Herschel locks himself in a room and over the course of about three weeks basically discovers on his own everything and more than Fox Talbot had, sends him all of his information, never hears back from him, and doesn't bother, by the way, to get a patent. He was happy to share uh, his experiments with everyone in the world, unlike Talbot was. So he called these originally heliographs or sun pictures, and then later on he begins to call them calotypes. Calotypes meaning beautiful pictures of, you know, anything he pointed this at. And as you will have read, um, he's not really interested in this as an art. He's interested in this as something that as yet has multiple applications. You can use it just to capture images of the world around you and can be used for kind of uh, endless different purposes, but he's not really thinking of this as an art form itself. The other thing I want to reemphasize about this is that Talbot, of course, uh, you know, patented his process and um, this patent remains in place uh, up until about 1850 or so. Uh, when a new process, the collodion type that I'll talk about next week, was developed and makes the calotype kind of superfluous. You didn't need to use it anymore because there was a better process around. So this gives you an idea of how a, a positive negative works. In 1841, Talbot switched to a process that produced a negative image on sensitized paper. He called it the calotype. It was a little bit less sharp and was considered inferior to the daguerreotype. Uh, but the thing is, it allowed for you to make multiple copies from one negative, which in the end proves to be something that is quite, um, you know, interesting about photography. And, and the main reason we think of, uh, you know, photography is so useful today, its ability to reproduce and to be kind of infinitely reproducible and ability to disperse this all over the world. His oak tree in winter is one of those uh, great examples of the early uh, calotype process going from a negative to a positive print. Then in 1844, um, he, in a series of installments, produces a photographic uh, book, in a way, uh, called The Pencil of Nature, in which he basically explains his development of photography and how it works and theorizes on its various usage. Now at this stage, um, you know, the photographic prints all have to be done individually and put into these texts in what's called a tip-in process, um, but it's, it's the way that he got his ideas uh, out there. As he said, the plates in this present work are impressed by the agency of light alone, without any aid whatsoever from the artist's pencil. They are sun pictures themselves, and not, as some persons have imagined, engravings in imitation. This is a really important idea, and it's one that we're going to come up against next week. What he's basically saying is that there is no real artist involved right? These are nature itself reproducing itself for us. They don't have any, anything more than a kind of operator helping this to occur. And here's the thing, when artists or when photographers want photography to become an art, they have to fight against this idea that it's just a dumb mechanism that reproduces nature. See, art has always been conceived of as an artist filtering nature or filtering the world through his or her sensibility and reproducing it according to their own feelings and emotions and viewpoints and so forth. And the camera conceived in this way, as one of the originators of photography had it, as a mechanism that reproduces just the way that the eye works 
um, you know, was something they had to fight against. How do you reinsert the artist into the production of a photograph? Here are some of the pictures from the Pencil of Nature, and you just see, you know, it's just him showing how this works. A piece of lace, um, a very carefully composed, by the way, doorway. There are multiple different prints of this with that broom set this way and that. Um, photographs could be hand tinted, so you could create a photograph and then go back in with a little bit of color, either really uh, watered ink or gouache or some kind of watercolor and print color. Color won't really be viable until the 20th century. And even then, you know, if you ever worked in color photography, you know that the color photograph was never, it never had the same resolution as black and white photographs. You know, a cupboard, he's just kind of showing you what it can do. Nothing particularly artistic about this. A haystack. A boy with a hurdy-gurdy. And then this, and I really want you to kind of look at this for a minute. This is one of the iconic images. He created a, uh, a kind of photographic, both um, experimentation center, development center, as well as a place that you could go uh, have photographs made in uh, Reading, England. And what you're seeing here is a, a combination print um, of all the different usages that photography can be put to. So let's just take the left-hand side first here. Um, here what you see is off to the left, watch my cursor, a, again, an early form of camera being pointed at a picture. Uh, in this case, it looks like a print. And so if you wanted multiples or to preserve a print, or frankly, if you wanted to take a huge print and decrease its size so that it was more manageable, you could have a photograph made of it. You see this guy sitting there, he's taken the lens cap and flipped it up. There is no real diaphragm at this point. And he's got, you know, a, a clock here to make sure that he's getting the exposure time right. Over here, you see a man getting his portrait done. Now he's even blurred out a little bit here and you can see that little thing holding his head in place as he strikes his pose. What else could you use it for? Well, you could use it for uh, taking pictures of nature, taking pictures of sculptures. You know, you can use it just to reproduce the world around you. It has multiple different reasons for being right now, none of which is extremely artistic in its own right. So again, just some other things. What could it be used for? You will read in your textbook, of course. It could be used to document things that, um, document, and that's a term we'll get to later on and kind of talk about all the inflections of that term. Document something that is uh, subject to uh, deterioration, like butterfly wings or fossils or something you, let's say, instead of having to go to a cabinet and look at, you could just have all your photographs there in front of you to look at because it was such high fidelity. You could reproduce things like hieroglyphics. Again, this becomes a quick form of printing technology. You could take a giant Italian print, take a photograph of it so that it was much smaller in size. And of course, you can document yourself and your friends. Although at this point in the 1840s, the daguerreotypes Resolution is so much better than the calotype, and the calotype is patented, um, and so you have to pay f to be able to use that process, that when used for these types of purposes, more people would want a daguerreotype at this moment than they would want a calotype. And it only really took off in England, where the daguerreotype, ironically, was uh, patented, the only place it was patented. And then, you know, in the background of this whole story, although he doesn't get, um, he doesn't get the headline like the other characters is Sir John Herschel, this British chemist who was able to reproduce all of uh, the, the uh, all of the developments and, uh, you know, investigations that 
uh, Talbot was able to very quickly and shared his ideas with the rest of the world rather than keeping them under wraps. Okay, well that's just your introduction to the development of photography um, and Next week, we will go on to look at how these ideas expand and expand in particular, both in portraiture, in the daguerreotype, and finally in the use of photography in relation to art forms in the 19th century in order to make an argument that photography could be an art form. See you then.